All right, thank you, Brent. Uh, bear with me, my voice is a little raspy tonight, um, but we're excited to be here with you. And uh, four years ago, we got the call to go to Emerge Ministries. And what we knew of Emerge is that it was on the back of the minister's credential card. And, you know, if there's a, a need that you had or a challenge that you would call Emerge. And, uh, you know, I remember in ministry calling Emerge for advice on a counseling situation. And uh, it was very helpful. It was good to be able to share the need, uh, to talk a little bit about it, and to say, here's, here's what I'm planning to do. And to have uh, a clinician say to me, textbook, that's what you should do. And it truly helped me in the situation that I was in uh, to know how to handle it. But about four years ago, the Lord called us to move from Florida to Ohio. Most everyone was going the opposite direction. And uh, the Lord just made it clear in a number of ways and then just began to convince both of us, and we'll talk more about that probably tomorrow, uh, that it was what he wanted us to do, that this was the next step in ministry. So we moved four years ago to lead a national counseling ministry. One year later, a pandemic hit. And suddenly, whatever stigma there was that remained about counseling was gone. Uh, now the stigma was, what's your problem? You don't have a counselor? <laughs> and uh, we began to add clinicians to our team. We would add a clinician. Their schedule would fill up. Uh, I believe two years ago, we did 37,000 hours of counseling in one year. And so much need, so much hurt, so many challenges that people are walking through. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing uh, at Emerge is, is just sharing a bit about some of the things that are going on. And before I jump into the teaching tonight, <laughs> Pamela is going to tell you a little bit more about that. Well, when we received that phone call from Emerge, I'm a, a preacher's kid from Michigan, and um, I immediately said, you don't want to go there. <laughs> he said, why not? I'm like, all the people who get in trouble go to Emerge. So we don't want to, like, represent the principal's office. And then, of course, God gets a hold of you and, you know, things change. But one of our missions in coming to Emerge was to change that, to see that changed. Because I know that for a lot of people who have gone to Emerge um, for various reasons and sometimes for restoration, uh, they will come by and say, I have an Emerge story. You know, it's real quiet. It's secret. I have an Emerge story. And um, the interesting part of it is that recognizing that we are all broken, we all have our, our needs in our areas where we need that support. We need someone to come alongside us. We need a place to go to so that we can be enriched and so that we can have a greater understanding of who we are as sons and daughters of God, who he's created us to be, and what we have to the, the, the world and all that he's given to us to serve the world that he's placed us in. So it really um, has become an honor and a privilege to serve at Emerge and to be able to serve on behalf of our pastors, our pastor's wives, our pastor's families. While we were, uh, when we moved from the pastorate in Boston and uh, Robert accepted a position of vice president of student life at Southeastern University, it shook me to the core because all I had known was pastoral ministry in the church, took me out of my, my comfort zone. And it was during that season that um, as I would cry out to God and say, what's all this about? I don't know how to function outside of, you know, a pastor's wife's role. I, I remember the Lord saying to me, I'm preparing you and Robert to stand between the pulpit and the pew to support pastors and to bring understanding to the people. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that was supposed to look like. I thought that's what was happening with us at Southeastern. Little did I know how Emerge comes, and that's exactly where Emerge stands, between the pulpit and the pew, bringing restoration, bringing health, bringing peace where there's, where there's brokenness, and bringing healing through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I have to say, that you would be so proud 
um, to see the clinicians that come together and their focus every day is to walk into their office in the anointing of Jesus Christ and to look for that moment when the Holy Spirit comes into the room and not only gives them wisdom to lead as a counselor, but, but opens, turns on that light bulb that only Jesus can within the heart of the person that is sitting there. And it's wonderful to hear the stories and to hear the healings and to be able to uh, rejoice with people who have come into healing. So we are honored to be there. For those of you that may not know, Emerge is celebrating this year our 50th year of ministry and service. And many of you may um, recognize the name Richard Dobbins, who was the founder uh, of Emerge for many years. And he actually came into Emerge as a pastor, a serving pastor there in Akron. Uh, the church is still there doing well. We kind of joke and laugh at times because they have the same old ugly green carpet that was in the president's office at Emerge for many years, and you see a lot of duplicates. But when he came in as a pastor, his wife started to struggle with her own uh, issues, emotional issues, suicidal issues, postpartum issues. And when he took her to get some help, no one could really help her. He went to Christian counselors, so-called Christian counselors. He went to other pastors, fellow pastors, and everyone kept telling her, you just need to read your Bible more and pray more often. When they'd go to a secular, a secular counselor, it was like, you got too much of that church stuff you're into. You know, you need to back off. So they, were, they had a difficult time finding that place that fit. So what did he do? He went ahead and got his doctorate. He was the first person to graduate from Akron University as a PhD in this field. And so what a beautiful combination, but what a trail he had to blaze, as you can understand, being in the church and being able to see uh, the church embrace mental health service, mental health healing, and uh, being able to be one that would come alongside a person that needs that. So for 50 years, Emerge has continued to uh, move through um, its growth, its development. It has been a place of education. It has been a place of enrichment for clinicians. And we are working to see this become even a greater place of enrichment for pastors, for Christian clinicians, Christ-centered uh, social workers, and um, being able to come together. So on October 19th, we are celebrating 50 years, and it's going to be an all-day conference, which Nebraska was a little closer to Ohio. It's going to be, an, if you want to fly in, let us know. We'll help you. But we um, are going to be having a conference from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. where pastors and clinicians can sit together can learn from Dr. Litchie, from Dr. Rick Serbin, from our director of clinicians, Dr. Dave pa uh, Blankenship, and then um, have some of our other clinicians involved. So we're excited. I would ask that you would pray for us when it comes to our celebration. It's a unique thing. I was telling, um, saying to them tonight, you know, when you're doing something in your church, you sort of have your, your audience built in. When you're doing something with the district, you pretty much know who's going to show up. Uh, when you're celebrating through a place like Emerge, uh, we, are, we are working hard to get tables filled and chairs filled, so we ask that you would pray with us because we truly want to be able to celebrate with the people who have been a part of our history and also those that are looking forward to the bright future that we have at Emerge. We are uh, very excited about a new initiative this year called Soul Care Intensives. Soul Care Intensives is a time, a three-day intensive for people to come to Emerge, and this is very focused on ministry leaders, uh, might be a deacon that might come alongside that definition. It would be pastors, pastoral staff, missionaries, um, our spouses, our children, um, those that lead alongside us in the church, and it's a time where they would have their own three-day intensive at 
emerge, and they would be meeting with a clinician and being able to work through some of the things that um, that they feel a need to to be able to deal with. And so we are looking forward to being able to see this area developed even more. And um, we are going to show you a, a, a video that's done with the gentleman that is um, leading our soul care intensives, Matt Kennedy. Matt is also the host of our podcast, XM. If any of you um, may recognize the name... Um, Sonic Flood, he used to be uh, one of the guys on the Sonic Flood band, and it was when Sonic Flood had to go off the road that Matt himself went to counseling and through that discovered that God had given him some gifts. And so we're so thankful for him and his leadership with the Soul Care Intensives. We can show that now. Thanks. What does it feel like to be a pastor? Peter Drucker says there is no role in the business world like that of being a pastor. Pastors are privileged to walk with others in their highest moments at weddings, baby dedications, and graduations. But while they share those high points, they also are the ones called to walk with men, women, and families in their lowest moments. They are familiar with broken hearts, broken families, and broken dreams. They walk with others into places many would not be willing to go. Hopes and fears, heights and depths, Mountaintops and deep, dark valleys, celebrations and devastations form the landscape of the personal and emotional journey of pastoring lives and souls. And this often tumultuous emotional journey is not a random occurrence for ministers. No, it's repeated over and over again. Such an emotional adventure and burden can take a toll on the souls of those who lead, serve, and minister to lift the souls of others. You've probably heard it said, if the pastor thrives, the church thrives. But the opposite can also be true. If the soul of the pastor shepherd, ministry leaders, a staff member is depleted, then the marriage, the family, the church, and possibly the community will follow. In a recent survey taken by leading pastors in the nation, these were listed as the top five challenges pastors are dealing with. Discouragement, stress, anxiety, depression, and family challenges. The clinicians at Emerge are specially trained to counsel district officials, pastors, missionaries, staff members, and the ministry leaders in your churches through Soul Care Intensives. The Soul Care Intense program is a three-day experience provided by highly skilled clinicians trained specifically to work with pastors, missionaries, and leaders in the ministry, as well as their families. It's 100% confidential and private. It includes a battery of psychological testing and six hours of intensive psychotherapy. This program is designed for anyone in ministry experiencing crisis, but it also can be used for those who want to get in front of problems, including marital issues, addictions, moral failures, emotional and spiritual wounds, and burnout, to name a few. This is an opportunity for self-care at a very deep level. If you feel like God is prompting you, a soul care intensive might be right for you, your marriage, or your ministry. Apply today at emerge.org. Well, thank you so much. We are excited because it, with this new initiative, every clinician at Emerge is being trained specifically to work with ministers and ministry leaders. So we ask for your prayer and we ask for your support. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We this do. is this is my exit. So <laughs> I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We're gonna have fun. Not too quick though, because tomorrow oh. morning we're gonna talk about marriage and ministry. Yes. And we have a couple stories to tell. So uh, you'll you'll want to be there. We're gonna talk about leadership intimacies, managing leadership intimacies yeah. tomorrow. And then in the afternoon there are sessions available. If you'd like to meet with the two of us or either one of us one-on-one, -on -one, we have four of those available tomorrow. So looking forward to it. Great. So this is my exit. I guess. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm sure you, uh, some of you recognize Dr. Don Litchie in that video who's been with you before. And uh, talked with him just the other day. He wanted me to send his greetings to all of you. Uh, he enjoyed, I believe he was with you like in a January 
one year. It was cold. And, uh, but he sends his greetings to you. Brent mentioned seeing the two of us at the banquet. And uh, Don actually was the interim president uh, after our former president had left. So when I came, Don told me that he wanted to resign. So out of respect, I said, sure, if that's what you feel God wants you to do. So shortly before the board meeting where Don was to resign, I had a check. I felt like I would love to have him stay with us. So I called him and I said, Don, are you sure you want to resign? He said, well, you're the new president. I feel like I should to just get out of your way. And I said, well, what if I told you I want you to be on my team? And he lit up and he's worked with us the last three years. And uh, it's been great. It's been great. He's been such a source of wisdom, such a source of help in many, many ways. And now, uh, last October, he had his um, retirement party and became vice president emeritus, which I told him that means you're going to work for us the rest of your life. (laughs) Well, as we... uh, As we jump into tonight's topic, tonight I want to talk with you about something that I believe most ministers, most ministry families are experiencing, and I call it the leadership squeeze, the leadership squeeze. Tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about leadership intimacies. Someone has asked me, when you look at all the people that Emerge has met with for 50 years, Now we're seeing more and more ministers coming saying, I'm here not because there's a problem that I know about, but because I'm concerned that there might be a problem one day. And I'm seeing peers and friends and other people that are going through struggles, and I want to make sure that I'm in a good place and my marriage is in a good place. So we're seeing more preventative steps that people are taking. And that's good to see. That's, That's healthy. Tomorrow night, Pamela and I want to share probably, if not the toughest, one of the toughest challenges we've ever walked through in ministry. And we want to just share that with you and and just spend time in prayer together with you. And then Wednesday morning, I want to talk with you about pivoting in leadership. What does it mean to pivot in leadership? What does it mean to to alter things in a way so that your impact can last longer? And that'll be Wednesday morning just before we leave. We're Pentecostal unless the Lord changes it in some way, right? Uh, We want to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. You know, St. Augustine said this in his well-known confessions. Lord, my soul is your house, but it's far too small. I need you to come and enlarge it. And Lord, there are things in my, this house that you will not be pleased with that I need you to remove. And there are rooms that I'm not always comfortable letting other people in that I need you to come and help me with. So my soul, it's like a house. Lord, it's your house. You know, when kids are little, we actually got a call yesterday from one of our grandchildren. And I thought, what's going on? And uh, our daughter, Kara, said, Nora wants to talk to Papa. Nora wants to talk. She's our little miracle girl. Uh, I'm sure maybe tomorrow we'll share a little bit of that story. But she was not supposed to be born, according to a number of doctors. She just was not going to make it. But she has. She called last night. And guess what? She gave her heart to Jesus last night. Amen. Amen. And it was so cute because she told me all about it. She told me why Jesus came. She gave me like the whole gospel last night. And we prayed with her and it was exciting and just seemed so sincere in her little heart. So now you know what her mom and dad are going to do. They're going to say, where does Jesus live? And she's going to say, right here in my heart. We say it with children, but often we look for fulfillment as adults everywhere but there. The God who is with us, the God who is in us, the God who said he would never leave us. Well, when Pamela and I ministered in Boston, downtown Boston, which we often spend time there, there's a house called the Skinny House. There's a picture of it, the Skinny House. 
It's nine feet wide. It has a kitchen. It has bedrooms. It has a living room. Four people can stand shoulder to shoulder in this house. It's called the skinny house. Augustine said, Lord, my soul is a house, but it's far too small. I need you to grow it, to make it bigger so that I have room for more people, room to bless others and to help them. You know, when I looked at this story, I thought, how did this happen? And I found out that there were two brothers during the Civil War. One younger brother went off to war. He and his brother were left land in Boston by their parents. So the older brother, while the younger one was gone at war, the older brother built a house and used 90% of the property left to them. And he left this little section for his brother when he got home. Big enough for sunlight to come into his portico of his new house. Because he thought, it's so small, my brother will never build a house here. And guess what his brother did when he got home? He blocked all of his son and he built this little skinny house that's still in Boston. Augustine said, the house of my soul is narrow. It is ruinous, Lord. Oh, repair it. It displeases your sight. I confess it, I know. But who shall cleanse it? To whom shall I cry but you? Cleanse me from my secret faults, O Lord. How many of you have moved to a different place in the last 10 years? Put your hand up. You've moved to a different place the last 10 years. Do you know what it's like when you move? And you always have that room with boxes in it that you're still going through, right? And if somebody comes over, we tell the kids, don't let anybody in that room. Don't, let, don't even let them know how to get in that room. And because we're sorting through boxes, still trying to organize and all of that. Well, how often in our souls do we say, when we don't want to deal with something, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go in that room. And yet often the Holy Spirit, that's the exact place that he wants to go. But fortunately, he's a gentleman. He won't force himself into that place. But often he will orchestrate, he's the engineer of our circumstances, he will orchestrate events in our lives that lead to us needing to deal with the truth of the things that would keep us bound in Egypt and keep us from the full freedom that there is in Jesus. Scripture I want to focus on tonight for a few minutes is in Ephesians 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, probably the most familiar part of this verse, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and forever. So in Ephesians, amazing book. I love the book of Ephesians. Paul talks about, I want you to know the dimensions of the love of God. So part of what I want to talk about the next couple of days is the dimensions of your ministry. The heights, the depths, the breadth, the length of your ministry. How much will you accomplish in your ministry? How deep will the roots of your ministry be? How broad will the house of your soul be? And how far will you have to go and what might that journey include? What might you have to walk through? What is the soul? You know, we talk about it, we care for the soul of people, the souls of other individuals. Uh, The soul, Dallas Willard said, you know what the soul is? It's control central. It's that central part that integrates every part of your life. One way I like to look at it, the soul is like mission control. 
you talk about the soul, and you know, we have ideas that dualistic views, you know, Trinitarian type views, uh, the body, soul, spirit, all these things. We know the soul represents that which is within you. So someone has said, unless that which is within you is connected to him who is above you, you will succumb to that which is around you. Unless that which is within you is connected to him who is above you, you will succumb to that which is around you. It's sort of like Apollo 13. You remember the Tom Hanks character when everything went crazy in the spaceship? And he grabbed the microphone and he called down and he said, Houston, we have a problem. You know, uh, some of you, as I mentioned earlier, you remember Dr. Don Litchie. I was new at Emerge, walking out of my office one day. And here comes Dr. Don with a fresh couple that he's just counseled. But they were grandparents. And he said, Dr. Crosby, do you have just a minute? I want to introduce you to this couple, and I would love to have you pray for them. Well, he had already gotten permission to share their story with me. They were probably in their late 60s, and he said they've just gone through something tragic. Uh, several weeks ago, they asked their daughter, could we take our five, your five-year-old grandson on our boat for the day? So they went out on an outing, had a great time. They gave him snacks. They kept checking on him in the back of the boat. They looked another time, and he was laying down in the bottom of the boat. And when they stopped to try to jump to, to his need, they found out that the carbon monoxide from that engine had been circulating around that little boy, and he had inhaled it, and he had succumbed to it, and they were not able to recover him. Now, here's this couple in front of me, and I'm hearing this story, and I'm just beginning to imagine the layers of trauma that they must be going through. Can you imagine how they felt as a couple? Can you imagine calling your daughter and son-in-law to tell them this news? Can you imagine how you feel when you have to get up the next day and the next day and the next day? Precious couple. They've shared this story publicly. Suddenly, you don't wonder what your soul is, right? Suddenly, you begin to say, do we have within us what it's going to take to get through this? The soul, God, my soul is, is too small, Augustine said. Leaders in ministry today, I believe many are caught in what I would call leadership squeeze. The getting caught between the demand to achieve results and the expectation to build relationships. Achieving results and building relationships. And in ministry, you're expected to do both, to accomplish and to care. But our development sort of hardwires us to be a little bit better at one of those than the other. You know, if you're very focused on accomplishing results, it's very easy to overlook needs within people. If you're very attuned to the heart needs of people, sometimes it's easy to overlook the demands of achievement in other ways. So this puts a squeeze on hearts and lives. And our development in life kind of hardwires us to do one or the others. So what is one area in life and ministry where you have felt the squeeze? I'm going to do something tonight. I'm going to do it about two times tonight. And we're going to do one in just a minute. I'm going to give you just a few minutes. And uh, then I'm, I'll let you know when that's up. And then we'll move, move ahead. But you're sitting around a table. So instead of listening to me share all night, it would be good for you to hear from one another as well. So here's what I want you to answer. And we'll see how many of you can share briefly within about three minutes. And if you're at a small table, scoot over to somebody next to you. And share this, what is one area in ministry where you have felt the squeeze? What is one area in ministry where you have felt the leadership squeeze, the pressure of leadership? All right, you've got three minutes, move around. Uh, all the extroverts at the table, get the ball rolling.
All right. Let's take about 30 seconds. So if you're talking, just go ahead and wrap up. So it's good to have a chance to be able to hear from one another. And what I hope is that some of these talks, uh, remember when we're all done, you can go outside, you can enjoy one another, get ice cream, and uh, conversations to be continued, which would be really good. So sharing some of those pressures, some of the squeeze that we feel, and you know, maybe as you've shared, you've heard some things or said some things related to other people that put that on you or putting it on ourselves in some ways, in one way or another. But nonetheless, the squeeze. The Apostle Paul felt the leadership squeeze. He said, I continue to deal with the burden of all these churches. I continue to care over them and be concerned over them. He told Timothy, Every time I think of you, I move to tears. And I'm sure not all of that was always encouragement. (laughs) But concern about this young man that he left in charge at Ephesus. Uh, One point, Paul said, I continue to go through the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Sounds like a parent. You know, one of the pains of pastoring is when you want more for people than they want for themselves. You see more in them than maybe they see for themselves. Maybe you have more hope for them than they yet have for themselves. That is a pastoral pain. Jesus felt it. At Gethsemane, he felt the squeeze that he he had great distress at Gethsemane. The squeeze of responsibility. Moses felt it. Moses said, Lord, must I lead all these people? Must I care for all of these people? We'll talk about Moses. You know, Moses is such a model and example for us. And you look, and we're going to talk tomorrow night about uh, one way in which the Pentateuch was set out for you and me as an example. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Why? To be an example of how God deals with people, of how God leads people, of what God wants to do through people. And there's something in it, and in the middle of it is the character of Moses. Moses called to lead, yet early on, Moses, you know, and uh, tomorrow uh, I'll share a little bit about my story, my voice. I'm having a rougher week with my voice this week. Uh, There's a journey, there's a physical challenge that I go through related to it that I have treatments for periodically. The challenge is when you have them periodically for a few weeks, you sound like Clint Eastwood or Marlon Brando or both of them put together. So, uh, but... It's, it's been one of the things that I've dealt with. Everybody has something that we walk through and deal with. And in the midst of it, we, we look to God. Moses, early on in his journey, God said, you're going to go and lead my people into freedom. And what did Moses say? God, I have a hard time talking, <laughs> all right? And God said, oh, we got that fixed. We'll just have Aaron, you know. If if you're not ready to go after it, if you don't believe that when you step in that place, I'm going to give you what you need, then you can just have your brother come with you. But this is happening, Moses. The calling of God is without repentance. But when you look at Moses, you look at the making of a man of God, the making of a person of God. God bringing him from the place where he was to the place where God wanted him to be. I often look at those having to go back to Pharaoh ten times. God, how about the third time? You know, how many things have you dealt with in your life, maybe even with your children, where, Lord, not again, not this issue again, not this problem again. And yet through it, God is working. I believe we're living in a season that is calling for what I would call a Moses-type leader. Think about this with me. Many of us want to be Joshua. Joshua is all about going and getting the promised land. We want all the good stuff, you know, from God. Moses is the picture of leading through the middle earth of ministry. Often ministry is not about being at the promised land. 
but it's helping people to get closer to that place. It's learning how to journey with people through wilderness. What does it mean to move from a Joshua type leader to a Moses type leader? Think about this. Joshua was about leading people to something. Moses was about leading people through something. Joshua said, learn from me. Moses represented learn with me. Joshua was all about success. Let's get in the promised land. Moses was about what? Survival. Survival. Joshua was about people come and hear from the pastor. Moses was pastors go out and serve the people. Go and minister to them. Joshua, driven by dreams. Moses was driven by needs. Joshua was about the attractional Sunday service. Moses was about the compassionate everyday ministry. Joshua was all about come to the leader. Moses was all about go to the people with needs. There's a difference. There's a difference. So there are pains in ministry. There are privileges in ministry, but there are pains. One is frustration, handling expectations. That's one. Another is what I would call dryness, soul depletion. Uh, when pastors functioning at a pace that they cannot keep up with and not admitting to their own emotional needs in life. And then another is depression. I remember talking to a pastor, listen to this. He worked at a large church. The pastor said, you're going to plant a church in a big city. To get you started, we're going to send six full-time employees with you. The church will pay for them and a million dollars. That was the start. That's a pretty good startup plan, right? Within two years, the startup church was running 2,000 people. 2,000 people, meeting in a high school auditorium. I still remember talking to him one day. I said, how are you doing? He said, terrible. I said, what do you mean? He said, people look at this and they think they want to be me and do what I'm doing. He said, I get up in the morning, I go to work out, I get in my car, and I want to go anywhere but to, to the church. He said, I want to drive and go to California. And why is it? Because... What was within him was not yet ready for all that he was facing. His character development was not yet ready for that opportunity. Jack Havert said, God never called us to build big churches. Instead, he's called us to build big souls. Big souls. The best kind of growing church is one that comes out of souls that are growing. People that in their house that is the soul that is the place that God lives, is making room for more people. Uh, one term we don't hear a lot about anymore is magnanimity, being magnanimous, having room for people. You know, I've been fascinated with a word the last couple of years, and it's the word wholeness, wholeness. God wants you and me to be whole. He wants us to experience wholeness. We hear a lot today about wellness the, the gospel of, there's a book out called The Gospel of Wellness. The writer has written for major magazines, Fast Company and others around the country. She's followed wellness practices, all the essential oils, all the, all the techniques, all the special exercises, all the, the apps and the programs. And she said, now we have people dealing with stresses from all the wellness Because they can't keep up with it. And she said, especially women in our culture are feeling stressed because they, you know, can't keep up with Gwyneth Paltrow or with, you know, all these different people and all the wellness. And they go to Instagram and compare themselves. And here it's supposed to relieve anxiety, but it's creating anxiety. Because there's a word that's more biblical than wellness, and it is wholeness. Jesus wants to make people whole. He wants to make us full. He wants to give us whole families, a whole soul, a whole heart. And I loved it tonight, Brent, when you read Psalm 46. And I thought, you know, you read that so appropriately because you read it slowly. And you paused and you said, Selah. 
And the words meant even more because of just lingering in the presence of God and letting the word of God bring rest to our souls. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. The more I work with pastors, the more Pamela and I meet with pastors and leaders, the more of a concern I have on my heart uh, and excitement over the privilege of partnering with them, but a concern over what they're walking through. Partly because of the burdens of leadership. I'm going to share a couple of those right now and a couple tomorrow. What are the burdens of leadership? You might say, am I the only one that feels this and walks through this? And I would say with these areas, I'm going to mention certainly not. One is the burden, as Moses would say in Numbers 11, 11, the burden of all this people. All this people. I heard a pastor that said, I love preaching. It's the people I can't stand. And he said, if I could just come in and get out of my car and go preach and go back home, I'd be good. And I said, my brother, I think you've lost the idea of what ministry is supposed to be. (laughs) How about the burden of this loneliness? Loneliness. It could be you're surrounded by people and busyness and activity, but you feel incredibly lonely. The lonely whine of the top dog. Loneliness. It's a very difficult thing to feel, especially when you have people around you, and yet you still feel lonely. Well, then pay attention to that. How about this one since COVID? Accumulated grievances. Anyone felt some of those in the last few years? The burden of accumulated grievances. I've talked to young pastors. One that told me when I get in the pulpit, young, strapping, tall, big, strong guy. He said, Dr. Crosby, I get in the pulpit and I'm having panic attacks. He said, the words in my notes are blurring together. And one time I actually had to get somebody else to come up. And probing deeply, I found out it was related to the expectations that he felt around him. Not being able to measure up, not being able to meet up, not being able to be what he thought people wanted him to be or needed him to be. Those are a few we'll talk about more. Ministry is about what I would call middle street. It's the middle place. It's not being on top. It's being with people. It's not being over people. It's being with people. Remember, who's our great example? God Almighty, the incarnation of Christ, the canonic passage in Philippians 2. He counted his role as God, not something to be grasped. But he humbled himself, right? He humbled himself and he took on himself the form of a what? Servant. And he became a sacrifice for you and me. He gave it all to come down to our neighborhood And to show us love and ministry, he allowed himself to be punished, persecuted, used up, spent, and crucified. That was ministry. That was giving himself for you and me. That was saying that I care more about you than I care about my own life. So ministry, a word that a brother in Christ introduced me to is liminality. The liminal place, the middle place, in between this place and this, in between Egypt and the promised land. The wilderness was the liminal place, the place of liminality. You know how Joel's gospel says, a weep between the porch and the altar place. That you and I, are ministry, and I know from Roman Catholic, a Catholic governance structure, We tend to reject the idea of the priest in some ways. That we would need anyone between God and us. And yet, God wants to do his work in others' lives. And he wants to use you and me. And he wants us to feel their needs. Ministry is in the middle in many ways. Uh, John Stott said, caught in the tension between what God has inaugurated by giving us his spirit and what he will consummate in our final redemption, We groan with discomfort and longing. The indwelling spirit gives us joy, and the coming glory gives us hope. But the interim suspense gives us pain, challenges. 
You know, I wanted tonight to be able to say what I wanted to say simply for you. And I, and I put it this way. The heights of ministry are not when we find ourselves over people in authority, but when we instead find ourselves with them in the midst of life and ministry. Spiritual leadership is not so much about ruling the high ground as it is about navigating the middle ground. I believe that we've swallowed some things in our Christian culture in America that are not in the Word of God. And I think that one of them is a misconception about leadership. We have listened to more business leaders teaching pastors about how to be leaders than the example of Jesus and Paul the Apostle. Amen? Jesus led as a servant. Paul hardly even talked about leadership. The the definition of leadership that Paul gave was this, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? So for me to lead you, I want you to watch the way I've learned how to follow. That's God. And yet, what do we do? If a book makes the bestseller list in America, we assume that it's going to be good for us. Now, I have a Ph.D. in organizational leadership. I've studied the field. I've, I've read much in that field. I've talked to many people about it. And the more I learned about it, the more intrigued I became with the ways of Jesus. He's called us to lead, not as CEOs, but as shepherds over souls. Your strength and what the Holy Spirit expects from you and me as ministerial leaders is not the flow chart of of an executive or a CEO on Wall Street. It's the manner of Jesus down the Via Della Rosa. That's what he looks for. We hear a lot today about self-care. But when I read about self-care, and even though we're in the field of counseling, I say, but wait a minute, didn't Jesus say that you're supposed to die to self, to live to Christ? So what does that mean? So ministry is about ministry in the middle, caring for people, loving them. I'd like to put it this way. God doesn't want you to feel the pressure of making your church grow. How about this? How about let your church grow? Let it grow. You know, Romans 12, the chapter that talks about uh, present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. In the message version, there's a powerful verse related to trusting God. And it relates to yielding yourself to him. And And I'll share that with you in a minute. But one of the squeezes that we experience in life and ministry The person next to us is not responsible for it. The people at church are not responsible for it. It may be that we're responsible for it, and it's this. When your expectations are here and your reality is here, what do you have in the middle? Stress. When your expectations are here and your reality is here, what you have in the middle is stress. If you keep raising your expectations, what are you going to have more of? Stress. The only way to reduce the stress is to either lower your expectations or change your reality. And life is a little bit of both of those really often. You know what Paul would call that? Paul would say, I've learned in whatever state I'm in, therein to be what? Content. I've learned the secret of contentment. In other words, I don't want to wrap up ministry as a bitter old soul. Right? You know who becomes a grumpy old man? A grumpy young man. That's how they start out. So guarding your heart and your soul becomes essential. But you say, but pastor... I'm a person of faith, and what if God tells me to do this, but reality is still here? Oh, that's different. That's different because if your expectation is here, and notice I said your expectation, and reality is here, what you have in the middle is stress. But if the Lord has given you faith about something, and reality is here, you know what's in the middle? It's not not stress. It's hope. 
It's hope because God has given it to you. And people will tell you, I could never believe for that. That would wear me out. We'll say, well, don't worry about it because God's keeping my heart full of hope. I know that this is going to happen one day. I believe it. I know because God is keeping it full within my heart. That's something that he does within you and me. I want to do one more thing tonight, and this is personal. I want you to pull out something to write on a note page on your phone or a piece of paper or whatever, and you're going to write something very brief, very brief, but very important, very important. When when you and I gave our hearts to Christ, um, I did that when I was 16 years old. My parents took us to Myrtle Beach. We camped at a campground of 2,000 campsites. I had a friend, a buddy on the trip with me, and he and I had one goal, to meet girls. That was, the, that was the mission that we felt called to that week. So the day after we arrived, 50 Christian kids camped right next door to us out of 2,000 campsites. And my dad and mom, they went over and they're like, hey, we can help you set up your tents. And my buddy and I were like, oh, we're out of here. The Christian kids are here. You know, we left. Until the next day, we noticed a couple of cute girls in the group. So we asked them out. We asked them to go to a movie, and they were clever evangelists. They said, we'll go to a movie with you, but you have two conditions. One, some of our friends have to come along. Two, you have to come to our campfire at midnight. So every night at midnight, they pulled the guitars out. They, you know, they did the kumbaya. They, they, uh, they shared testimonies and all this. So we went, we said, okay, we'll do it. Well, they showed up with like 12 chaperones. We go to the movie, we go to the campfire that night, and I began to hear young people share about their faith. I began to hear kind of cool guys that had cool cars, but they got up and talked tenderly about Jesus and about the change that he made in their lives. And I was just getting ready to turn 16, and I never had heard people speak so personally about God. And I was compelled, and the Holy Spirit drew me in, And my life, I look at before that night, June 12th, and after that night. And God did something inside of me then. But in the midst of it, that sweetness in our spirit, what I've discovered is that expectations can cause you to lose that. Pressures and the squeeze can cause you to lose the aroma of Christ in your life. People being around us and sensing the Lord in our words, our ways, our works. Sometimes I get up and I say, Lord, don't let me just do works today. Let me do good works. Breathe within the work that I do. Be alive within me in the work that I do and help it to honor you. So here's what I want you to write down. What's an expectation that you've put on yourself that could steal something of Christ within you? That could wear you out. What's an expectation that you've put on yourself that you need to be aware of and you need to bring before God? Just write it down. There might be a few. You might have a list, but just take a moment and write that down. And we're going to do something with those in just a minute. All right, something personal in your heart, something in your life. As we spend time these next couple of days together, and we're going to get out and have fun. Yes, I do want some go-kart therapy before I leave. And, uh, but in the midst of it, we want to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants to do within us. And Pamela and I count it such a privilege. We so appreciate the opportunity, uh, Pastor Toby and Kim, being able to be here, and Brent and Amy being able to be here with you. And we, we don't take it lightly. But as you consider that and as you look at those things, Scripture says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The best thing that you have to offer to the people that you serve in ministry is the kind of soul and spirit that you have. That when they get around you, that they feel Jesus in you and me. 
the best thing our kids can get from us is that they feel the authentic Jesus inside of us and in our words and in our ways. And there are times when I hear myself say things or do things, and I'm like, Jesus is not at all in that. He's not living in that. That's not him. That's me. You know, on our website, we have some articles and different things, but it's interesting we took a look. The, the one that people have downloaded and read the most of late is called 12 Ways to Work on Your Joy. I'm putting the QR code up here, but 12 Ways to Work on Your Joy. And I thought it's significant that one of the major things people are wanting help with is how can I work on my joy every day? Remember, Jesus said, ask and you'll receive and your joy will be made complete. It will be made full. It will be made whole. It will be a wonderful thing. But in the midst of it, something that can cause us to lose that closeness to God in our soul and in our spirit that can cause the house of our soul to shrink. You know, that that house in Boston, there's another picture. If you get closer, there's a sign on that house. And you know what it's called? The Spite House. It's the Spite House. Because that younger brother came back and he said, doggone it, my older brother once again tried to get the best of me. And he's going to try to push me out or push me around. And that older brother represents that person in my life and yours who gets in our way or who rubs us the wrong way or who hurts us in some way or who tries to diminish us in some way. I remember when we had a guest speaker when I was pastoring a church in Boston and I dropped him off at his hotel after the service. And he said, hey, Bob, he said, When I get up in the morning, I'm going to be praying for different people. How can I pray for you? And I said, listen, I got this guy on my board. And he's just giving me all kinds of grief. And I mean, I prayed about it. I've talked to him. It's just going nowhere. Would you pray that God would take him to another church? He said, yeah, I'll pray about that. Sure. So the next morning, I picked him up and He said, yeah, I prayed for you this morning. I was all interested. I I thought he'd have a prophetic word. He's leaving in a week. He said, I prayed for you, but I'm not sure if you'll like what I felt God told me. And I said, what is it? He said, I felt him impress me. And I was a young minister. He said, I felt like the Lord impressed me that he's put this person there to grow the leadership muscle in you. And I thought, I rebuked that. (laughs) To grow the leadership muscle in you. Do you know every now and then there are things we don't want to hear, but they become the things that we hear again and again and again. And how many times I've felt that as a young pastor, and even still, that God's like, I'm growing something through this. I'm doing something through this. You don't have to resent it. You can move with it and trust me. So tonight as we pray, I want to ask you to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, I'm calling on the God of Moses. I'm calling on the God of Mary, the God that gives favor to the humble. You know, the best way to worship God is not just to know the latest worship chorus, but worship becomes greater the more humble we become. The more we humble ourselves under him, the more he's exalted over us. So I want to ask you to do something tonight if you're able to do it. In a minute, I'm going to ask you just to take your chair and move it out a little bit and find a way to just kneel. You might want to kneel down at your chair. You might want to sit on the edge of your chair and kneel forward. But I want you to take what you've written, that expectation, that thing that could wear you out, and bring it to God and release it to him tonight. And I want to pray with all of us as we get ready to posture ourselves to do that. And we're going to give you a few minutes. We'll play some music as you pray and wait on God. And then Pastor Toby will come up and close us out. But let's just pray together. Take that in your hand. Hold that in your hand. Lord, we just come to you tonight. And we know that your word says that he who guards his soul is better than he who takes a city the one that watches over and guards their soul and their spirit, the one that guards their spirit is better than the one that takes a city. So, Lord, this week, we invite you to search us 
And we want to say to you tonight, God, the things that, that we need to say. So lead us as we pray. And among them, God, a few that have been helpful to me that I often find myself needing to say is, God, I am nothing without you. I am lost without you. I am empty without you. And I would add one more to the list. Sometimes we hear in our culture and world today that there are ministers who want to resign, that they want to leave what they're doing. But Lord, we would pray that next prayer, Lord, and we would pray it as I resign. But we'll say this, I resign myself to you and to your will. I yield myself to you and to your will. And in that spirit of humility, I just want to invite you just to kneel before God and spend time in his presence.
Thank you, Lord. God, thank you for this moment where we can just be real before you. God, thank you for these powerful words that speak to my soul and all of us, God, about where we stand before you with this assignment of ministry you've given us. Lord, we're in this room because we share that, that we feel a call of God and we pursued that call. And with that are the challenges we face. But God, thank you. Thank you that you've counted us worthy to be part of this group, that you've, that you've called us out to, to face these challenges and to serve you. And so, God, along with my own expectation I lay down, we submit these expectations to you tonight. We lay them down at these altars. And we say, God, help us. Help us, Lord, to have the right expectations that you give us, Lord for our ministries. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, that was, that was a powerful moment for me. Anybody else in here feel that way? That, I want to thank you, Dr. Crosby, for that message. That was right on. Can we express our appreciation to him and his wife? And I think this is